my name is Evie Chong. I am the Public and Community Engagement Coordinator at Baobe Collective. Baobe Collective started in March, where we decided to do um, a lot of translation works on, uh, at first it began with um, personal financial aid programs released by the federal government. And so at first, uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, a lot of people were losing uh, jobs and being laid off. And so um, this obviously impacted the Vietnamese community in the case where a lot of people work in factories or nail salons. They tend to be um, undervalued work. And so we knew that a lot of people were transitioning into um, receiving EI. And EI at the time, or employment insurance, was the only program that was available for uh, people through the federal government. Um, and so we decided that Understanding that there was a lot of um, barriers to getting access to these resources, uh, primarily needing to speak English or navigate English as your primary language, we knew that that was a difficulty for a lot of people within our community who speak primarily Vietnamese. And so we decided to do a translation project under the name Baobe Collective. Baobe meaning to protect in Vietnamese. We decided to do that just so then there were available resources for people within the community to actually educate themselves on what EI was and how to obtain it. Um, but then we also recognized that there were a lot of uh, youths uh, within the community who are probably in the position to help their parents um, navigate the system uh, by acting as translators for their family. And then in the middle of our project, uh, CERB was released by the federal government. And so we um, since then have translated that as well, uh, teaching people how to uh, go through the process of making an account, of making a file for yourself and applying for uh, these financial aid programs. I think one of the things that uh, hit me first at the very beginning was how fragile citizenship is. I think we saw, we were, we were all witness to the news reports where a lot of young Asian women were being attacked because COVID-19 had been so racialized to the point where um, it became synonymous with particular bodies. And so repeating as, you know, it was mentioned in the, in the discussion panel, this idea of yellow peril or the fact that um, certain bodies were deemed as disease or having brought uh, COVID-19 to uh, North America, Canada. You know, my stance has always been that there's nothing that we could possibly do that allows us to escape our own racialization. So what does that mean under the constructions of colonialism, under imperialism, under the fact that um, citizenship is so powerful in what we think we gain from it, but how it's also very fragile in the way that um, nothing stops us from, from the kind of violence that we experience. And so when we actively buy into this idea of citizenship, what are we actually gaining from that? And under what kind of particular project? And I also say this in the context where um, before the lockdowns happen, uh, there were wet um demonstrations all around Vancouver um, and all around Canada, I would say. This is a ongoing process and thinking about what does it actually mean to be a settler. Um, I think this is a, a really fragile conversation to have within the Vietnamese community, especially because so many of us are uh, former refugees. And so myself and including a lot of other second generation folks, we are direct descendants of people who were refugees or who were considered uh, boat people. And so sometimes there seems to be this kind of um, the sense of entitlement that we should belong here because we were displaced from our homeland and Canada was the place to take us in or the U.S. was the place to take us in. When a community is so deprived of the bare necessities to live, I think that changes the way we view not only citizenship but experience our racialization within the context of whiteness and white supremacy and also with the growing tensions around um, anti-black racism especially in the U.S. and which also was a conversation that BBC had to have as well. For us it's really been about trying to take the necessary steps to unpack what our traumas are uh, within the community slowly 
and with a lot of generosity and with care because with a lot of people, this is their first time ever coming into this conversation about racism or what anti-blackness is or what does it mean to, to perpetuate anti-Indigenous racism. There's so much there that isn't just COVID-19 related, but has happened in this year alone that is a lot to process and to talk about. I will say that it's been really hard to not be uh, within the spaces that we consider our second home or where we find ourselves in community with each other, especially because um, that meant for me and for a lot of other folks not being able to go to Chinatown as much, especially because there was, there's a lot of seniors who live in the area, but also because it is a part of the downtown east side and knowing that people don't have access to basic resources, but that you could potentially, um, you could potentially harm them if you didn't know if you were sick or not. Um, community organizing work tends to be very domesticated to the point where it's also feminized and it's also the expectation that it's free. And so that's been very difficult to, kind of experience that kind of work, knowing that we're incredibly tired and exhausted by what we do, but also understanding the necessity of it and trying to sustain ourselves off of it as well. I'll be very honest, like as you folks recently found out, I work at UBC as well um, at the library and Mimi and Kathy have also been on a contract basis with other work. It's a precarious time to, dedicate ourselves so much to this and also being worried about whether or not we could pay our bills. Um, it's an incredibly, I would say, vulnerable time for so many folks. Um, I would consider myself lucky and, you know, we do have privilege in the sense that we do have secure housing, but that's not always the case for everyone else, especially when um, some of the emails that we get through BBC have been Vietnamese seniors um, either being evicted or not knowing what rights they have as tenants. So how do we all hold this together? And I think that's been such a learning process in terms of not just thinking about, okay, well, what do we have access to? But also thinking about who do we know that could help us as well? And so we've been able to really branch off and really be able to lean onto other people in such an odd time where you can't always meet people in person. When BBC first started, the translations were mostly done by Mimi and Kathy. When we released the website, we, got, we were contacted by someone from Toronto who works as, uh, as a curator, actually. And he said that he was like, oh, well, I, I was born and raised in Vietnam, and I noticed that some of your translations were a little bit off. So how can I help you? Like, I would love to volunteer um, and just edit the work that you've already done because not everything makes sense grammatically. So we took him on his offer and to see the amount of care that people have given us because they understand that this is a necessity and this is a resource that the community needs has been really amazing. And so Pak, Pak Pham, he, um, he did the translations with, with his friend. Um, and it was just a very, interesting way to begin because these are people we didn't know that we didn't meet giving us so much for our community for our collective sense of care for one another and so i would say that that's been interesting but also reminds me that the ways that we're connected with each other seems to be so much more porous these days as well